So think about the water you saw this morning and think about your own kind of prediction in your own brains. Do you think this water... Even what is that? Oh. Is it web? No, it's like Most of the population in southern Oregon's Jackson County can be found in the Bear Creek watershed. In the fall of 2013, fourth grade students at Griffin Creek Elementary learned about their watershed and how it's connected to the Rogue River and finally to the Pacific Ocean. I'm John Letts. My wife Liz and I became coastal educators during the summer of 2013. We designed and delivered a series of lessons that address Oregon's fourth grade science standards using the local environment as our classroom. We met with the three fourth grade classes in their Griffin Creek classroom, teaching them preparedness for bringing their studies into the field. What if it's raining? Or a plastic bag for me to stay That's a real dry. safety thing too. We're gonna, in any place we are, we're gonna give you some safety instructions. Students took a pre-instruction survey so we could see which parts of the unit needed teaching and which parts they already knew. Now you looked at the surveys very closely. I was very impressed with the surveys. Ever since you filled this out, if you're going, oh man, I wish I knew more about that. No, that's okay. Because if, if it shows you didn't know about that, that's what we're going to teach you. The surveys revealed that students had no knowledge of what a watershed was, and some were frustrated about the salmon life cycle. Oh, we'll be talking a lot about the salmon cycle, so by the time we're finished, you'll be able to name each of those stages of the salmon cycle and have a really good understanding. On the plus side, almost all the students had very positive feelings about science and a fair grasp of water cycle. The fourth grade teachers worked closely with us in planning out the unit and teaching some of the concepts. Sometimes the hardest part was working Liz and me into their schedules. Early in the unit, we introduced the classes to the concept of science inquiry. So, science inquiry is about asking questions. We knew that chunking all these preliminaries was pushing the envelope for maintaining interest, but the kids were remarkably tolerant of so much verbal input. Enthusiasm soared when Liz taught an art lesson on right brain drawing. Students were to follow an imaginary ant crawling on all parts of their fist. Nature sketching is an important skill in its own right, but we were mostly interested in training the kids to slow down and notice details, a critical approach to observing nature. This one, my fingers are crossed, and I didn't really do too good on the markings uh, for the, uh, what are they called? I don't remember what they're called in the light. The knuckles? Uh, yeah, and the lines on them. And this one, I did all the lines and the nails better, and it didn't cross my fingers. Springing from the fist drawing activity, students applied what they learned to accurately sketching cottonwood leaves. Looks out of a, something out of a professional journal. Very good. Very nice. Well, Mr. Lutz, oh, seeing these guys attend to details and being quiet and being so focused, I could see us taking the kids outside for this activity. On the pre-instruction survey, students listed objects they saw from their classrooms. The responses were listed 
and now the students were reviewing the data. on there somewhere because I remember yeah, helping. The student groups then shared their observations based on the data they had just reviewed. As these observations became more sophisticated, students were ready to explore nature in their own schoolyard collecting data from plots measuring a square foot each. Look around at the trees around us and see if we can find where it matches. Doesn't seem to be in the butterfly garden, huh? Students also use their now honed observation skills to notice the shape of the Griffin Creek watershed and the living and non-living things in it. They also learn measurement skills, which they would use soon on a field trip. The skills developed in the schoolyard of Griffin Creek Elementary were put to use during the first watershed field trip. The field study began along Ashland Creek in Lithia Park. Drawing from skills they learned in the Griffin Creek schoolyard, students collected data on the girths of Lithia Park trees. The trees here required some creative problem solving and some knowledge of math, since the tree girths exceeded the length of the measuring tape. One of the challenges we had encountered was the inability to distinguish between types of trees. A tree was just a tree before. Now students spent more time observing the differences among trees and learning the local tree names. At Lithia Park, Griffin Creek students were able to apply the scientific method of doing plot inventories. This was the kind of data gathering that fit with Science Inquiry, part of the Oregon State Science Standards. At Lithia Park, students were introduced to water quality testing. Using a kit borrowed from Bear Creek Watershed Education Partners, I demonstrated chemical testing of dissolved oxygen in Ashland Creek water. Okay, so again, away from anyone's eyes, a little bit good splash out of here. So it kind of looks like apple juice, right? Yeah. You don't ever want to drink this stuff. 
Okay, so watch what I'm going to do. To measure it carefully, I'm going to put this in here. Now I'm going to take this and put it in this little bottle. We have to very carefully count the number of drops of this chemical that we're putting in here, and we have to swirl it every two. Okay, so let's see what happens if I put two drops in. One, two, swirl it around. Three, four, swirl it around. Five, six, swirl it around. Seven, eight, swirl it around. Has it changed to me? Nine, ten, swirl it around. Eleven, twelve, swirl it around. Oh, I see quite a bit of change there. At twelve. Thirteen, fourteen. Oh, that's almost clear, isn't it? But it has to be all the way clear. Fifteen. That well, looks pretty, about as clear as water, doesn't it? I want you to put D-O in your books and write 15. D-O 15 and I'll clean up all this stuff later. In order to compare later with water on the coast we measured salinity. S-A-L means salinity. Oh you did an excellent job. That, that definitely matches and we have about seven. We also measured pH for comparison with Bear Creek. Oh, thank you, Madison. On the afternoon of the same day, we had similar activities downstream on Bear Creek at Coyote Hills Nature Center in South Medford. Here in the Bear Creek watershed, and this is what it's named after, Bear Creek. This is Bear Creek right between <laughs> Phoenix and Medford. So think about the water you saw this morning. Students were encouraged to predict changes, if any, from the water quality data they had collected that morning from Ashland Creek. Even though it contains water from Ashland Creek, do you think it's going to have the same measurements as we had this morning? Do you think it might have some different measurements? Comparing and contrasting was one of the cognitive skills addressed in this full day of exploring our watershed. New data was collected here and students focused on trees that would someday shade Bear Creek. Students adopted a young tree. Griffin Creek students were given a special invitation to a Saturday event called Kids in Creeks. We were hoping for a heavy turnout by Griffin Creek families because they would get to witness the Fall Chinook Salmon Run in Bear Creek. While we didn't get participation in the numbers we'd hoped for, some did attend and got a lot out of the event. They can't get the oxygen from the water. Okay. Hey, glad you made it today. so much fun. I love it. I knew it. As we prepared students for the next field trip, we shared with them current events that had to do with our watershed and how the salmon cycle affects the actions of our community. In order to keep our group sizes optimal for instruction, we split up the fourth grade during our second field trip, with one half rotating to the Rogue River Grange for a watershed map exploration activity. It was a type of scavenger hunt for information that could only be found on the Bear Creek Watershed map. We borrowed a set of those maps from the Bear Creek Watershed Education Partners. It's going to be really hard to do. The map is tricky. You look there, you look here. You're right on it. You got it. So what's color? The other half of the class began the day at the park 
emerging from the bus and soon descending on the Rogue River, where they rotated through four stations. One of the stations was familiar to them, listing the items found in a plot. Only this was a very different place with different discoveries. Hold on, let me take a quick check. Whoa, what's this? What's this plant? Please. No, smell it. Hey, this little titty bowl. Oh yeah. Hey, Gavin, put that bowl. How do squirrels eat this? It does not look like yummy. What is this? Yeah, it's the Hey, put down, Gavin, put it at the bottom of the page. Mystery plant. Let's see. It's the stuff that has the bulbs on it. It looks like something that somebody would play. It looks like a bird. I say acorns, acorn pops to see. From a squirrel out there, maybe. Maybe from a squirrel. Wait, try to make it straight. I'm not trying to make it. There you go, then. And I'll draw. Okay, okay, wait. Okay, wait. It's up to here. Sixteen and a half. Sixteen and a half? Sixteen and a half centimeters. Yeah. Sixteen and a half centimeters. No, no, you need a magnified glass for that, dude. Oh, no one's hey. using it. Why am I not? I hey, but how long is it? It's the feather? Yeah. Uh, three, uh, two and a half inches. I found a really cool acorn. It had like a spider web inside of it. Right here. The kids were able to safely enter the Rogue River here to collect macro invertebrates. Working in teams of two, they used D nets to capture macros that were released by agitating the rocks where they hide. You guys have something moving in there? Yep. Holy cow! We found like a ton. See, I told you this spot was good. Whoa. 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 The macro invertebrates that we found were identified at another station, run by retired science teacher and Bear Creek Watershed Education Partners volunteer George Duran. Them crawling around and see them because what they do is they have these special little adaptations on their feet, <laughs> these little claws that allow them to hold on to the rocks. So they kind of crawl around under the rocks and you don't really see them. So you'll learn how to collect them because you just can't go there and then just, you know, net them for instance. So there's a special technique. Macroinverters, important. Why would anybody uh, want to, uh, or why, why are these things important? You know? Oh. Perfect. Yes. Two reasons that macroinvertebrates are important. These, this is the basically start the food chain for any kind of fish or vertebrate. Okay? There's other things other than fish in a creek or river that eat these. This is what they eat. Okay? Are these are these bugs or insects or macroinvertebrates. Big word. The other reason is that they're an indicator species. Certain macroinvertebrates uh, can only live in really, really clean, pristine, uh, nice water. Other ones, other macroinvertebrates, can live in really polluted and dirty water. So when you make a collection, um, sometimes if you make a, a real good collection and you go about it in a scientific way, you can make some generalizations. Duran taught students how to pull out the macros they'd collected and how to sort them by their features, like the number of tails. Now sometimes, if it's too big, you'll need a bigger turkey baster. Is that too big? All right, good, you can tell the tails. Now what you always do is when you try to get one of these, you're gonna get some water in there, and you put them in there. You put all your two tails in one compartment. And then if you see something with three tails, put it in another compartment, okay? There's three tails That helps right you there. allow, good, all right? So. That's what I want you guys to do. Students got to compare water quality between Bear Creek and the Rogue River through water quality testing on the Rogue. 
Done here by Clayton Gillette, another Big Web volunteer. The lowest is one and the highest is 14. What's right in the middle? Uh, seven. Seven. Salmon are like Goldilocks. They don't like the pH to be too low. They don't like the pH to be too high. Salmon are like Goldilocks. They like the pH to be just right. Right, right in the middle, seven. Good day. Good day. Count with me. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let's tap your hand a little. Okay, thank you. Okay, same thing. Now we put two white powders into our clear water. Okay. As with the earlier test on Bear Creek, Rogue River water was tested for dissolved oxygen level. Okay. Shake it up. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a second. What color was the chemical you put in? White. What color was the chemical? White. White. So what happened? Turned yellow. Turned yellow. What do we call that if it changes color? Looks like something. Chemical reaction. Look at this river here. You'll see this is way bigger than Bear Creek. Oh, yeah. This has water from as far away. Oops, you're on the wrong side of me. There you go. Good. We have water here from just below Crater Lake, a place called Boundary Springs. And we have a bunch of tributaries way up there on the other side of Lost Creek Dam. Collecting macroinvertebrates is another way of determining water quality. The students collected and identified a number of stonefly and mayfly larvae, indicating good water quality for salmon and steelhead on this part of the Rogue River. Salinity level was zero. While the afternoon group came out to the park to rotate through these centers, the morning group had lunch at the Grange Hall and learned a little history about the Grange movement. Let's put our crops together and at the Rogue River Grange, students did Reader's Theater to reinforce knowledge of the water cycle. They also got to do the same map activity that their classmates got to do earlier that day. Starting with their schoolyard and expanding to the Bear Creek watershed, then going beyond to the Rogue River, these Griffin Creek fourth graders were able to explore and observe the natural processes to make their community such a special place. They learned that water temperature matters, that salmon are important here, and that taking care of our own watershed affects the river and even the ocean. We didn't get to take this group to the coast like we'd planned, but when they do go, they'll understand the processes in their own watershed that make the coastal environment healthy and how, through the salmon and steelhead, affect our home so far inland.